Small town, big spookies. I hope you've hoarded enough toilet paper to handle all these pants-stainingly creepy stories I've prepared for you today, all of which are set in small towns. Enjoy and remember to send me your scary stories soon. Doctor says if y'all don't send me enough four stranger stories, my liver will turn purple. I'm not sure that matters though, cause I don't really see that thing much, but if you wanna help, send those four stranger stories to me at darkstories.org. And hey, go to eeriecast.com while you're at it and enjoy hours upon hours of our other free horror podcasts. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Paranormal Encounters on a Native American Reservation From Chuwak 79 This is my paranormal experience at the age of 11 years old in Toppenish, Washington. To explain my story, we have to go back to February of 1991, as it didn't start occurring until after this incident. It was Valentine's Day of 1991. I was with my sister, who's eight years older than me, and I was 11 back then, so she would have been 18. That day, she picked me up from school. My mom loaned her the car for the day. We took a back road home, called Track Road in Toppenish, Washington, on the Yakima Reservation. Once leaving school, it's pretty much a straight shot to our house. We lived about five miles away from Toppenish. There was a vehicle at the stop sign of Branch Road, the road we took to get to our house on. The car was on the wrong side of the road. My sister attempted to drive around him. He turned and sideswiped our car on my side. The impact pushed us into a patch of gravel on the shoulder of the road. My sister lost control of the car, and we rolled three times. I have no recollection of any of this. The last thing I remember was him hitting us, and my sister saying, Oh crap! But then I think I blacked out. I remember later waking up in the ER to my family standing around me in the hospital bed. My head hurt, and so did my right hand. I spent a good two to three weeks in Yakima Regional Hospital. The doctor had to sew up horseshoe-shaped scars on my head and had to put a skin graft on my right hand. Once released from the hospital, months went by. Follow-up appointments also followed. We got into the winter months of the year. I began having insomnia issues. In my bedroom, my single bed was next to the bedroom window. I had pink see-through drapes, and I always felt something was looking in my window three to four times a week. I wasn't sleeping well. The drapes broke. I was waiting for my mom to eventually get some new ones. One night, while lying in bed, my eyes were shut, but I was tossing and turning. I rolled over on my right side. My arms were still bandaged up. I still had to go through a series of reconstructive surgeries on my right hand. We found out the skin graft would not grow with my body. It was wrapped and splinted up, so I couldn't get comfy in bed. My eyes opened, and instantly out of habit, as I had no drapes on my window, I looked up. I wished I wouldn't have. I saw a brown-skinned man with dark, long hair, dark eyes that looked hollow. He appeared to have olden day regalia on, no shirt but war paint on his face, red and black strips across each cheek and on his forehead and chin. He seemed to have something draped across his shoulder. Maybe a bow or a quiver, I'm not sure. The moon was out, and it had snowed, so it was as plain as day. His hand was touching the glass, but there was no fog surrounding it, the way a normal living person's hand would when touching cold glass during winter. He looked as if he was longing for something. He looked sad. But at the time, mostly, he just scared the crap out of me. I was 11 going on 12, and there was a strange man standing outside my bedroom window. We only have one level to the house. I gathered my courage to get up out of bed and tiptoe. I went to my mom and stepdad's room next door. The man watched me every single step I took. He looked like an old warrior from the old days before reservations were a thing. His eyes were so hollow but piercing at the same time, gazing at me. I whispered, Mom? She didn't wake up. A little louder, I said, Mom? What? 
she said. There's a man standing outside my bedroom. Both she and my stepdad got up, shocked. My stepdad went outside and kept asking if someone was out there. Once he got to the outside window of my bedroom, he looked down, and there he found two distinct footprints right outside my window. With snow on the ground, obviously tracks would be left, but there were no tracks leading to or away from those two prints. This guy kept visiting me any time I slept in my room. For a while, I had to sleep in my sister's room with her because of this. But for the duration of while that window had no drapes to cover it, if I ever got brave and tried to sleep in there again, every time I'd be sleeping and I'd wake up with that feeling I was being watched. Beyond watching me, he never did anything to me. But the final straw was when one night I woke up. I had that feeling and I was expecting to see him again outside my room. I opened my eyes and to my horror, he was standing right next to me in my bed looking down. I yelled for my mom. She and my stepdad came running into my bedroom. Four years of reconstructive surgery, my hand being bandaged and splinted up, I couldn't get out of the bed fast enough. It was like his gaze with those hollow eyes made me paralyzed. My mom and stepdad looked through my room because when they ran in there and turned the light on, as soon as the light was on, he was gone. The moment that light came on, I could even move again. I ran from my room, crying, terrified. I would no longer set foot in that room. I slept with my sister, and she was okay with that. By the way, if you're wondering about my sister's health after the accident, she walked away with just bumps and bruises. At the time of the accident, the guy who hit us got out of his car to look at us. In shock, he got back in his car and drove away. Back then, my biological dad gathered up his friends and looked for his car. We'd given a description of it. Both my mom and dad split up nights and stayed with me while in the hospital. Anyway, time went on, we got some new blinds for my bedroom window, and after that night, the man never returned. My dad never could find the guy who hit us that fateful day in February. Years went by, and it was like I'd forgotten about it. Four years of surgeries done to my hand, and I have a visible scar. We believe when the car rolled, the broken glass and my side of the car was smashed in. That's how I got these worse injuries. One day when I was about 15, I was talking to my mom about the Indian guy outside my bedroom window. She took a long sigh, shaking her head as if to say it's time to tell you. After that night he appeared in my bedroom, she found a local medicine woman, and while I was in school, she had the woman do a cleansing on our house. She left my mom with some jugs of blessed rose water, some bundles of sage, telling her to make an offering to the man who keeps coming around. It didn't have to be something extravagant. I believe my mom left some food, some form of talisman, outside, which were taken by someone. She doesn't know who or what took it. The legend or folklore on my reservation, we believed he was a stick Indian, a cursed native spirit who wanders along waterways. We do have a ditch that runs behind our house. The medicine woman told my mom that the car accident and injury I sustained made me more open now, that it would attract some things like him. She believed he wanted me. She didn't know what for, other than the fact I was alive and he wasn't. We never speak of stick Indians, as to speak of them is to attract them. My mother did as the woman told her, and I never saw him again. The medicine woman, I feel, is right. I felt more aware of things after that car accident. Things that made me a cautious child from 11 years of age and on. That man never appeared again, and I'm glad. I'm 43 now. When my gut says to burn sage, I do it. I've been a cleanser now ever since I discovered medicine ways, Wicca, and Taoism. I'm not a religious person, but I believe earth and nature are both beautiful breathtaking, but they also harbor things we as humans do not understand. I don't deal in anything dark, but I have studied dark arts and magic just to know it, and I know when I come across someone or something that's not good. 
This story was hard to share. It's been over 30 years. I've sort of stored it in the back of my mind, in the we will deal with this later folder. Thank you for letting me share this, even if he never did anything to me. Those eyes still haunt me to this day. When I see any kind of footage of possessions or paranormal things happening to people, I often see their eyes get that thousand-yard gaze. They dilate, like they're dark and hollow. And every time I see that, I see that man. And I get a shiver down my spine. Dirty T from Dave C69. This was around 1974. I was about five years old, living in a small town in the Midwest. There wasn't much crime back then. It was the kind of area where no one bothered to lock their doors even at night. I had recently begun kindergarten. My parents were divorced, and I lived alone with my mom. My mom worked full-time as a secretary, so after school I would have to go to daycare. The daycare was run out of a residential house about six blocks from my school. I only had to cross one street to walk from the school to the daycare, and there was an adult crossing guard on that street every day to help kids cross the street. After crossing said street, I would turn left to walk the sidewalk for a block or two, then turn right on the street where the daycare was located. One day after school, I crossed that street, like I always do, and I headed left as usual. As I approached the corner where I needed to turn right, a tall teenage boy came running out of the house on the corner. He stopped right in front of me, blocking the sidewalk. He didn't say anything. He just looked down at me with a creepy smile on his face. I tried to walk around him, but he moved to block my way. I tried a couple of more times to walk around him, but he continued to block me. He never said anything either, just continued to stare down at me with a creepy smile. Finally, he sticks his hand in the pocket of his coat, pulling something out. After he pulls it out, he shows it to me. He's holding a plastic syringe. It had a sharp needle on it. Because the plastic is partially transparent, I can see that the syringe has something in it. The syringe was filled with a dark brown liquid, and it had some solid particles in it. When I was five, the only thing I could think of was that it was dirty tea. That's what it looked like to me at that age. Tea with dirt in it. I was more confused than anything else. Why was this older boy blocking me from going to daycare? Why was he showing me a syringe? Why was the syringe filled with dirty tea? After about a minute, I guess the teenager grew bored with whatever game he was playing as he walked away and went back inside his house. When I got to the daycare, I told the owner slash manager of the daycare what happened. Or at least, I tried to. My understanding of what happened was rather limited back then. But I do know that she left the house for a while. Other adults were there. I don't know what she did after that. Hindsight being what it is, I think it's most likely that that boy was an addict, and his drug-addled mind thought it might be a good idea to shoot up a little boy. I guess I'm lucky he changed his mind. The Sunflower Field From Red Rum 8521 All of this began when I was around four years old. It has occurred every few months since then. I live on the outskirts of a small town in Wisconsin. We had just moved into a new house, so being the child I was, I was nervous. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal. I could tell when things were watching me. I would usually spend my time with my grandmother at night, as I'm scared of the dark. I was extremely paranoid that night, because new house, new things to be scared of. For reference, my grandmother's room was across from mine, and my brother's and parents' room were downstairs. When I was sent to bed that night, I reluctantly went. I could feel something watching me every time I was alone in the house. I crawled into bed, and I fell asleep in a few minutes, trying to ignore the shadows. I remember having a dream, 
It's rare for that to happen for me. It was completely silent, no birds, no crickets, chirping or wind, nothing, just silence. I stood in the middle of a sunflower field that I can only assume went on for miles and miles on each side of me. There was a woman, roughly five foot four to five foot six, with long wavy brunette hair. She was standing there in a white dress with her back facing me. I called out to her. Hello? She ignored me, but she was only a few feet in front of me. There was no way she didn't hear me call. I tried to walk towards her, but no matter how far it seemed I walked, I didn't move, and it stayed like that for as long as I was in the dream. But then I woke up, sweating, feeling very hot, despite it being cold outside that morning. I talked to my grandma about it. The color in her face drained when she heard me describe that dream. She had had the exact same dream, and something had always happened after each time it occurred. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but it happened, and it still happens. However, my grandma has since then passed. The dreams still occur, though. I'm not really sure if it's trying to warn me about something, or if it's just reoccurring for no reason. But it continues to happen every few months, and it terrifies me each time it does. The last time I had this dream was around January 24th, 2022, and my dog died not too long after. I'm tempted to use a Ouija board to see if I can communicate with whatever is causing the dream, but I'm not really sure. What do you think? The White Ghost Lady From Anonymous This happened in a small town in Oklahoma called Spavanaugh in October of 2018. Ever since this happened, I can never stop thinking about it. I go to sleep every night with fear I'll see this creature again, whatever it was. It was a bright, normal day. I was with my grandma and my sister. We were planning to go to Spavanaugh Park for the day. When we got to the park, we had this signature spot we always sat at. Years ago it was clear, but nowadays it's just all woods and trashy. The park is right next to the dam. The floodgates weren't open, so it wasn't all that loud. We had some food with us, and we were planning to stay until dark, so we could tell some scary stories, trying to spook each other. But my sister doesn't get scared easily. By the time it got dark, my grandma and I were ready to go home, but my sister wanted to stay, to play in the field by the woods. I, of course, didn't want to. It was pitch black and I was young. She convinced me to go play with her, though, and by the time we started playing in the field, I wasn't really feeling scared anymore. My grandma headed back to the car to get water, and my sister was in charge. She wanted to go explore the woods now, and I couldn't really say no because she was in charge. So we headed into the woods. By the time we got into the woods, we could hear our grandma calling for us, but my sister did not want to go back. Eventually, I talked her into going back, and when we did, our grandma was extremely mad, asking if we'd seen anyone. We just shook our heads. My grandma then told us to get our stuff and get ready to leave. As we were getting our things, we heard a branch break. I turned around, looking to see if anything was there, and sure enough, there was. My sister and I just stared at what looked to be an all-white figure. It was a lady in a white dress. She had pale skin and white hair. We stood there, the two of us, staring at this white lady. And I kid you not, she stared back at us. Her eyes looked foggy, almost like a gray color, and she moved slow and smooth. My sister tapped on my shoulder, so I told her, I see her too. I spoke softly to not scare this entity. After a while, the lady turned around and walked away. When we turned around, our grandma was right there. She told us that was the creature she saw while we were gone. That's why she had asked if we had seen anyone. We still go to our signature spot at the park, even though it's just mainly woods and tall grass now. 
My grandma and grandpa try hard to keep it clean and mow it every once in a while, hoping to see that lady again. We share this experience with our family on Halloween every year to scare the young kids. Still, to this day, my sister, my grandma, and I will never forget this very odd moment. We hope that, whatever it was, it wasn't there to hurt anyone. The Woman in the Window From Tia Beanie A particular village in the country of India derives attention from a popular folktale. A woman, whom the villagers consider to be a witch, apparently roams the village at night, knocking on houses to be let in. But once the door is open, unknowingly or even out of curiosity, it was said that she would devour any children of the house, leaving the adults in a frightened haze. To prevent this from happening, the villagers came up with an idea. They all wrote the words, Come tomorrow, in thick paint on the doors, thus creating a timeless loop where the witch would read the message and leave to come back the next day, only to read the same thing and repeat. It's unclear where the legend started, but to this day every house in the village has a mandatory come tomorrow sign. The village became famous for this legend, and the story was later adapted into a feature film. Well, on to my story. I grew up in a metropolitan city, pretty much a concrete jungle, and I had no experience with things of the paranormal variety. My family was also pretty spiritual and Hindu hymns rung out throughout the day at the homestead. So, generally, there was a very positive vibe. The first time I even experienced a difference in the general vibe of the place was when I went to a small town, about 300 kilometers away from home, to work on my degree. Though this place was pretty modern, it wasn't nearly as metropolitan and harbored many small town beliefs. It was also prone to communal violence and moral policing, so I mostly just kept myself, never leaving the hostel once it was dark. I shared a room with two other students who came from small towns, believing extensively in paranormal phenomena. They would often tell me stories of the land and their collective hostel living experiences. According to their stories, before the hostel building was built, there used to be a huge ring well in the area, notorious for young lovers ending their own lives, forced to that end due to their religious affinities. I'd heard rumors of honor killings and the like when it came to inter-religious love affairs, and I'd even witnessed communal tensions, so self-killings of this kind didn't seem too far-fetched. When my university took over the land, they had closed the well up and built this hostel, and some of my hostel mates claimed to still hear the wails and screams of young men and women as they plunged to their deaths. I never heard anything of that sort, so I couldn't believe it, obviously. What surprised me, however, was that just like in that village, the door to each room had Come Tomorrow painted on it. The folktale was pretty popular, so I figured it was just a gimmick to ease students' minds. I would laugh at these tales and think of how small town these people were to believe in these things. One night, however, changed my whole perception of what can potentially exist in our world. I was lying down in bed, restless, while my roommates were fast asleep. My bed was right by the window, and looking out, you could see the hallway that led to the bathroom. The hallway lights would always be on, as most of the students would prefer studying outside by the stairs sometimes. I was drifting off to sleep, my eyes focused on the hallway, when all of a sudden I saw a black figure standing there. My first thought was that it was a student, but the more I looked, I realized the figure was pitch black with no discernible features, just a silhouette of darkness standing in the middle of the hallway. The figure was tall and seemed to glide along the path. It soon disappeared out of view, but by then, I was shell-shocked. I had no idea what I'd just seen. Some part of me wanted to believe that I was just seeing things, that my eyes had been playing tricks on me. I managed to whisper my roommate's name a few times. Being a light sleeper, she woke up and came to my bed to console me. As she sat there with me, asking me what had happened, 
Her gaze went to the door across the room. Since the hallway was lit up, a bit of light always seeped in the room every night. This time, there was a shadow there, as though someone was standing right outside the door. We were both freaked out, because if it was a friend of ours, they would have knocked and we would have answered. Besides, it was a Monday at around 2 a.m. when everyone would be sleeping. After what felt like an eternity, the shadow moved away and the lit up doorway became clear again. My roommate and I stayed huddled close for a while before we eventually drifted off to sleep. When we told people the next day, some made fun of us, some believed us, but all of them swore they weren't up at that time trying to pull a prank on us. I mentioned this in passing to my hostile warden, who said the energy in this place wasn't quite right, owing to its dark history, and that come tomorrow the sign was intended as a precaution. I never saw the figure again, nor did I have any other paranormal occurrences. I left the hostel pretty soon after that, and moved in with a friend close to the more urban parts of town. But to this day, that night is clearly etched in my mind, and I shudder every time I think about it. Possible Hellhound Sighting From ReadyWeb I'm not sure how to start this as I've never shared this encounter with anyone before. This story is very real to me. I know what I saw. I was about nine years old when it happened. I don't remember every minuscule detail, unfortunately. Back then, I was living in a very small town in Texas. I had a friend who lived out in the boondocks. I would spend many weekends with this friend. For this story, I'll call her Jay. Jay lived about 15 miles out of town and lived on a nice portion of property. We were out on her porch one night. It was pitch black out. Without the porch light on, we wouldn't have seen anything at all. At some point, I happened to turn towards the driveway to Jay's house, as I'd lost interest in whatever she was talking about at the moment. I saw a glint of red moving up and down, as if it was walking. I stared at it for a moment, trying to comprehend what I was seeing. My eyes focused on it after maybe 45 seconds of staring. It appeared to be limping. The way it was moving was just wrong. I guess limping is the closest comparison I could make. It was pretty big from what I can picture in my head, maybe the size of a Russian bear dog. I vaguely remember it turning to me, its eyes solid red. They glowed like red floodlights in the dark. Jay finally realized what I was doing and turned to look as well. Her eyes widened and she ordered me to go back inside. I glanced at her as I stood up, turning back to this thing to get one more look. It was almost skittering towards us, although slowly. I then booked it into my friend's house, staying far away from the windows at whatever cost. I realize this encounter is short, but I want to know what this was. My best guess is a hellhound, but I'm not sure. I would love to know what you think, and thank you for listening. That brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. More terrifying stories are on the way soon, so subscribe and smash that like button. By the way, did you know this show is available as a podcast called Unexplained Encounters? Just search for, follow, and rate Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. This show is part of the EerieCast network. Go to EerieCast.com for more scary podcasts, such as Freaky Folklore, which explores your favorite monsters, myths, and mysteries, as well as Redwood Bureau, a fictional horror podcast about an agent on the run from an evil secret organization that captures supernatural creatures and entities. Well, thanks for tuning in. Stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.